Hey everybody, hope you all are doing well. This video is going to focus on Dagoberto Gilb's Romero's shirt, uh, one of my favorite short stories, and I think a short story that perfectly engages and encapsulates many of our course themes. Uh, okay, so let's get going. If you have your, so what, what I always suggest you do, and I repeat myself often, but but it's for good measure, I believe. When you read these stories, print out the forum questions or have the forum questions handy with you. And as you read the story, try and answer the forum questions alongside. And it makes it easier. A lot of our stories as well, too, they're meant to be reread. I don't know if you think the reading is heavy or not in the course. I don't think it is really, but the reason is because a lot of these stories are balancing ambiguity, a lot of difficult matters going on, and they're meant to be reread and, and close read and read slowly. All right, so let's jump right into Romero's shirt. <clears throat> think of Romero's shirt too, when we talk about elements of literature, differences in literature. What, what, uh, what the first thing I notice when I read anything, any literature, any fiction, a novel, a short story, poem, who is the speaker? What is the speaker? What point of view are we getting? Oil and steel, we get the speaker, the adult offspring of the father. So we only get that speaker's point of view. Saving Sorty, we get Nia's point of view. Nia is 11 at the beginning, and she's 15, 16 at the end. So we only get Nia's point of view, who's very articulate, very bright. I think she's she's brilliant. And then in Baldwin Sonny's Blues, we get the brother, the narrator's point of view, who's educated, articulate, and bright. I mean, he's a high school algebra teacher as well, so we get his point of view. In the first day, we get the little girl's point of view. These All of these stories are told from the first person point of view, where we get just the one view of a character. And I, the little girl who is a little older, but looking back on these moments when she, her first day of kindergarten, I think she's brilliant and bright and articulate and has a way with words as well. The flowers, a third person point of view. We have a narrator, Maya, is innocent myop uh she's in her head right she's not so we have another a narrator telling us the story and it's the same with dagoberto gilb's romero shirt we get some of romero's thoughts and feelings but we're from a third person from a narrator and i'm going to talk about why or, or ask you why in a little bit all right let's jump right in romero's shirt and this first paragraph I, I think it's quite amazing. I love it. It's like for description, detail, it's writing 101. Juan Romero, a man not unlike many in this country, has had jobs in factories, shops, and stores. He has painted houses, dug ditches, planted trees, hammered, sawed, bolted, snake pipes, picked cotton in Chile and pecans, each and all for wages. Along the way, he has married and raised his children, and several years ago, he finally arranged it so that his money might pay for the house he and his family live in. He is still more than 20 years away from being the owner. It is a modest house, even by El Paso standards. The building, in the adobe style, is made of stone which is painted white, though the paint is gradually chipping off or being absorbed by the rock. It has two bedrooms, a den which is used as another, a small dining area, a living room, a kitchen, one bathroom, and a garage, which someday he plans to turn into another place to live. Although in a development facing a paved street and in a neighborhood, it has the appearance of being on almost half an acre. At the front is a garden of cactus, nopo, acatillo, and agave, and there are weeds that grow with yellow flowers which seed into thorn hard burrs. The rest is dirt and rocks of various sizes, some of which has been lined up to form a narrow path out of the graded dirt, a walkway to the front porch, where, under a tile and one by tongue and groove overhang, are a wooden chair and a love seat, covered by an old bedspread, its legless frame on the red cement slab. Once the porch looked onto oak trees, 
Two of them are dried out stumps. The remaining one has a limb or two which still can produce leaves. But with so many amputations, its future is irreversible. Romero seldom runs water through a garden hose, though in the backyard some patchy grass can almost seem suburban, at least to him when he does. Near the corner of his land, in the front next to the sidewalk is a juniper shrub, his only bright green plant, and Romero does not want it to yellow and die, so he makes a special effort on its behalf, washing off dust, keeping its leaves neatly pruned and shaped. There's so much going on in that first paragraph. You can almost think and compare and contrast to the first paragraph of Edward P. Jones's The First Day, right? Remember, there's that long description of the little girl and what she's wearing and going to school. Right off the bat, and this is illustrated even more so in the next paragraph, Romero's a working man, right? He does all these jobs. I, it makes me think of Ma and saying, sort of, Romero's a hard worker. I don't know if I've ever known too many people in my life who has worked as hard as Romero. Think of what he's, you know, think of Romero's work and hard work in the context of the American dream, too. You know, they have a house, they have a house, but look at it. Two bedrooms, a den which is used as another, dining area, living room, a kitchen, one bathroom. I grew up in a house with one bathroom and I I never want to live with one bathroom again, right? Like my wife and I's apartment now, we have two bathrooms. We're lucky. But you know, is 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 think of this when you have a house, you want more than one bathroom. You want more, you know, so just think of these little details, right? But then also the details and the zeroing in on the flowers, the yard. And we have the juniper shrub, which is is important to Romero, right? This is his place. Second paragraph. These days, Romero calls himself a handyman. Here's, here's where we're getting into the second question on our forums, too, where it talks about work. You can see that at the beginning, all the, all the work he does. He could do anything, pretty much, right? Jack of all trades, Romero is. These days, Romero calls himself a handyman. He does odd jobs, which is exactly how he advertises. No job too small in the throwaway paper. He hangs wallpaper indoors. He paints, lays carpet, does just about anything someone will call and ask him to do. It doesn't earn him much, and sometimes it's barely enough. But he's his own boss, and he's had so many bad jobs over those other years, One's no more dependable. He's learned that this suits him. At one time, <clears throat> at one time, Romero did want more, and he believed that he could have it simply through work. But no matter what he did, his children still had to be born at the county hospital. Even years later, it was there that his oldest son went for serious medical treatment because Romero couldn't afford the private hospitals. He tried not to worry about how he earned his money. In Mexico, where his parents were born, he spent much of his youth. So many things weren't available, and any work which allowed for food, clothes, and housing was to be honored by the standards there. Romero lived well, except this wasn't Mexico. And even though there were those who did worse even here, there were many who did better and had more. And a young Romero too often felt ashamed by what he saw as his failure. But time passed and he got older. As he saw it, he didn't live in poverty, and here he finally came to realize, which was where he was, where he and his family were going to stay. Life in El Paso was much like the land, hard, but one could make do with what was offered, just as his parents had. Romero always thought it was a beautiful place for a home. Wow, that's an amazing paragraph. Again, it starts with the list of jobs. Question two, describe Romero as a worker. What does he do? There's a list of jobs, right? What can he do? Pretty much any damn thing, you know? Anything handy. I bet you Romero could work on a car, work on the house. Anything handy Romero can do. And I bet you he does a damn good job. Is he a hard worker? Hell yeah, right? Hell yeah. There's a lot going on in this paragraph too, but it's so subtle. Like this is such masterful writing. 
look at the top of 243. You know, Romero's taking all these odd jobs. He's working for himself, which is what we all want to do, right? Why? We don't want to work for the boss. Top of 243, look at this. But he's his own boss. And he's had so many bad jobs over those other years. One's no more dependable. He's learned that this suits him. And this echoes Tobias Wolf's That Room. Think of Miguel and Eduardo. You know, how many bad jobs do you think Romero has had? How many times do you think he's probably had to put up with a shitty boss who wants to pay him less, undercut him, treat him like dirt? How many probably racist bosses he's put up with, treat him horrible, it's ripped off, worked and not get paid for what he's worth? So many. So many Romero doesn't even need to mention them, right? So many you can imagine. Romero, they're all in Romero's head. Romero has a list of all of them. And you can see why in many ways, like I love Romero. He's a cold man though, and he's a hard man. He's tough. He's had to build that exterior, that tough exterior, that shell around his body and emotions that he won't let anyone in because he's been probably Think of all the think of all the shit Romero's had to put up with. More than more than we can imagine, right? So many bad jobs that he doesn't even need to say them. It's not like one or two, it's a ton, right? American dream. That if we work hard and bust our ass, Romero's worked hard. Romero's bust his ass. We should be able to get things. And Romero has his house. At one time, Romero did want more. And he believed that he could have it simply through work. We all do, right? We all think we can get what we want simply through work. But no matter what he did, his children still had to be born at the county hospital. So no matter how hard Romero worked, it was never, and he, it's not like Romero wanted a fancy car, fancy house. Romero is one of those men too, he wants for nothing. We're going to talk about that when we get to his clothes and stuff. Romero probably never buys. Think of Ma. Ma doesn't want fancy clothes, fancy car, fancy house. Fancy. She wants better for her children. All Romero wanted was his kids not to be born and treated at the county hospital. And they still were. At one time, he wanted more. <clears throat> However... And a young Romero too often felt ashamed by what he saw as his failure. You know, this person has this, this person has this. <clears throat> if I work harder, I'll get these things. But time passed, that moment, and I have it underlined, but time passed and he got older. As he saw it, he didn't live in poverty. And here he finally came to realize was where he was and where he and his family were going to stay. Romero always thought it was a beautiful place for a home. So much going on in these, in these passages. But Romero's another character, you know, he continues our trope of, think of the characters in our story. Ma, the mother in the first day, Sonny, that aren't, they never went to college. They're not college educated, but damn, they're smart. They have a lot more, you know, they know about, they know a thing about a thing about the world, right? Think of what Romero knows. Think of how he has learned the hard way. And it's not, this isn't, you know, think of this, this moment here in this paragraph. Romero just isn't settled. Is he settling? He, I mean, and then we all settle a little bit, right? Think of this. We all settle a little bit. But it, Romero always thought it was a beautiful place for a home. But still in the back of his mind, it haunts him. Right? The next paragraph on 243. Yet, people he knew left to Houston, Dallas, LA, San Diego, Denver, Chicago, and came back for holidays with stories of high wages and acquisition. Think of this. Uh, people left. You leave, you take a gamble, right? If, if you leave for a better job or you try to find better work or you try to make more money, it's a gamble. It doesn't always work. Everybody who goes to these places to seek out better employment, better jobs, it doesn't always work. And Romero is probably thinking about his family. 
his his wife, his kids, his family back in Mexico. And if he, he could lose it all. So it's like, you're, what happens, right? I could have, you know, Romero, this could have been me. This could have been us. We could have had more. But I could have lost it all, you know. And think of where Romero comes from. How much schooling do you think Romero has? We don't know. He's not college. This gets into the point of view. We're not getting Romero's first person point of view. Whereas, and Romero's one of those men who, I bet you he doesn't say too much. He's not a talker. He just kind of assesses the situation and does the work. You know, does Romero have some high school? I bet you Romero dropped out of school early to do what? Work, right? Romero, why am I, you know, to work and help out the family? Again, when we think of community and family, family is what's important to Romero. And more and more people cross the river, and I love this moment too, look at this. And more and more people cross the river in rags, taking work, his work at any price. Romero constantly had disciplined himself by remembering the past, how his parents lived. He had to teach himself to appreciate what he did have. Those two sentences there, Romero's thinking about the immigrants coming across and taking his work. They're like, damn, they're undercutting me and taking my work. What I love about this moment too, Romero constantly had to discipline himself by remembering the past. Romero doesn't seem angry, salty at these people in that Romero's like, damn, they just want a better life. You know, I can't begrudge them for wanting a better life because I did the same thing. So where it's frustrating that these people are coming across and taking the work from Romero at a cheaper price, he's also, you know, these people just want a better life too. His car, for example, he'd kept up since his early 20s. He'd had it painted three times in that period. He worked on it so devotedly that even now it was in as good a condition as almost any car could be. So Romero, he takes care of things, right? Romero's the type of guy He's not buying a new TV. The TV works, so I replace it. The clothes, they still, there's no holes in them. You know, I, the, the car runs, why so replace it? For his children, he tried to offer more. An assortment of clothes for his daughter. Lots of toys for his sons. So Romero is a type of man too, no gifts for himself. He doesn't spend a dime on himself unless it's a necessity. Romero reminds me of the type of person, you don't buy Romero a Christmas gift or a birthday gift. He'd be mad, right? Put it towards something, the house, the bills, something toward the future. He denied his wife nothing, but she was a woman who asked for little. Those three lines, that line says so much that he denied his wife nothing, but she was a woman who asked for little. Married to, how could you ask for more being, you see Romero living his life this way. You know, some of that's going to rub off. For himself, it was much less. He owned some work clothes and t-shirts necessary for his jobs, as well as a set of good enough, he thought, shirts he'd had since before the car. He kept up a nice pair of custom boots, and in a closet hung a pair of slacks for a wedding or baptism or important mass. He owned two jackets, a leather one from Mexico and a warm nylon one for cold work days. And he owned a wool plaid Pendleton shirt. His favorite piece of clothing, which he thought, which he bought right after the car and before his marriage, because it really was a good looking, besides being functional. He wore it anywhere and everywhere with confidence that his quality would always be both in style and appropriate. Here's the story Romero's shirt, right? This is his shirt, the Pendleton shirt. This is his favorite piece of clothing. It's durable, fashionable. He feels good in it. And we get the, you know, the title comes from Romero's shirt. The border was less than two miles below Romero's home, and he could see down the dirt street which ran alongside his property, the desert and mountains of Mexico. The street was one of the few in the city which hadn't yet been paved. Where does Romero live? Where does Romero live? He doesn't live in the suburbs. He doesn't live in the projects. He doesn't live in, you know, the suburbs where, hell, now they're probably more upper middle class than when I was younger. You know, you used to think of the suburbs as middle class, right? You live in the suburbs. 
and you think of the projects as where the poor folks live. Romero's not quite there. He's just above, though, right? He still lives on the dirt road. Romero liked it that way, despite the runoff problems when heavy rains passed by as they had the day before this day. A night wind had blown hard behind the rains, and the air was so clean he could easily see buildings in Juarez. It was sunny, but a breeze told him to put on his favorite shirt before he pulled the car up alongside the house and dragged over the garden hose to wash it, which was something he still enjoyed doing as much as anything else. He was organized, had a special bucket, a special sponge, and he used warm water from the kitchen sink. When he started soaking the car, he worried about getting his shirt sleeves wet, and once he was moving around, he decided a t-shirt would keep him warm enough. So he took off the wool shirt and draped it conspicuously over the juniper near him at the corner of his property. He thought that if he couldn't help but see it, he couldn't forget it, and forgetting something outside was losing it. So that tells you a lot about where he lives too. You leave something outside, losing it, someone's gonna take the damn thing, right? You leave something out, so that tells you where he lives too. Not the greatest spot. He lived near a school and teenagers passed by all the time. And also there was a regular foot traffic. Many people walked the sidewalk in front of his house. Many who had no work. Think of Romero too, not just the jobs he takes and works for money. Romero's the type of guy, and you probably know someone like this, your mom or dad, grandpa, uncle, aunt, grandmother. They're not sitting on the, around the house on the weekend, right? Romero doesn't sit and watch the football all day Sunday. If he has free time, he's out working on things. Something on the house that needs fixed. I could wash the car, I could trim the, I could mow the lawn. You know, he's, Romero's always working. I bet you Romero probably never sits down for longer than a half hour. He's wasting time, right? He's working, you gotta work. After the car was washed, Romero went inside and brought out the car wax. Waxing his car was another thing he liked to do, especially on a weekday like this one when he was by himself when no one in his family was home. He could work faster, but it took his time spreading with a damp cloth, waiting then wiping off the crust with a dry cloth. Short story, right? But you have these details. Romero working, exactly what he's doing, attention to detail. You know, we can picture Romero, there's probably something soothing, something relaxing about the work Romero's doing. I don't know what you do, to relax, I read books, you might watch TV, you might doodle on your phone. Romero works. And you can kind of get the working, the waxing, the trimming. It's you know, soothing to him. Then he went for some pliers he kept in a toolbox in the garage, returned and began to wire up the rear license plate, which had lost a nut and bolt and was hanging awkwardly. As he did this, he thought of other things he might do when he finished, like prune the juniper, Except his old shears had broken, he hadn't found another used pair because he wouldn't buy them new. <laughs> I got an old pair, you know, I gotta get them sharp. I'm not buying a new pair. Here's the old man in the story, right? The kind of foil for Romero. An old man walked up to him carrying a garden rake, a hoe, and some shears. He asked Romero if there was some yard work needing to be done. After spring, tall weeds grew in many yards, but it seemed a dumb question this time of year, particularly since there was obviously so little ever to be done in Romero's yard. Think of this. Romero's yard, you know, Romero doesn't have much, right? But damn it, his yard looks immaculate. Romero probably keeps everything in tip-top shape. And it was a dumb question because Romero's probably like looking at this guy, like, man, this guy is coming over here looking to see if I need work done. <clears throat> There's no work that needs to be done. You know, you're coming over here looking for something easy. But Romero listened to the old man. There were still a few weeds over there and he could rake the dirt so it'd be even and level. He could clip the shrub and probably there was something in the back if he were to look. Romero was usually brusque with requests such as these. Why? Why? Why was he brusque? Because there's not a lot of work that needs to be done. You're coming here looking for an easy job for some easy money, right? But he found the old man unique and likable. He listened and finally asked how much he would want for all those tasks. I love this moment too, where Romero uh, is, you know, Romero can bargain, right? A good, a good bargainer. Romero's a good bargainer, right? Uh, look at this moment. The old man thought <clears throat> as quickly as he spoke and threw out a number, 
10, 10 bucks, right? Romero repeated the number. Questioningly, Romero, 10, $10. And the old man backed up saying, eight, seven. Romero asked if that was for everything. Yes, sir, the old man. So the old man kind of bar bargained himself down. You know, Romero didn't even counter off. Romero's just, the less you say, right? Yes, sir, the old man said, excited that he seemed to catch a customer. Romero asked if he would cut the juniper for $3. The old man kept his eyes on the evergreen, disappointed for a second, then thought better of it. Okay, okay, he said, but I've been walking all day. You'll give me lunch. The old man rubbed his striped cotton shirt at his stomach. Romero liked the old man and agreed to it. Why does Romero like the old man? The old man's like a character, right? You ever meet like just a character and you just like him. He told him how he should follow the shape which was already there to cut it evenly to take a few inches off of all of it, just like a haircut. Then Romero went inside, scrambled enough eggs and chili and cheese for both of them and rolled it in some tortillas. He brought out a beer. That's, I love that detail. I love that sentence. He brought out a beer. How much beer do you think Romero drinks? Not a lot. Romero, Romero is, is a man who never lets himself get out of control. He always has to be in control of the situation, right? This is this is a story here too. And when Romero, because think of think of all the horrible jobs and all the times Romero has been taken advantage of, screwed over by horrible, probably racist bosses. Romero needs to be in control. So think of what do you think Romero goes through a week? Say he gets a six pack or a 12 pack, two beers, right? That's it. Romero's not knocking back a 12 pack. Romero's not knocking back a six pack. He brought out a beer for the man. He likes the man. The old man was clearly grateful, but since his gratitude was keeping the work from getting done, he might talk an hour about his little ranch in Mexico, about his little turkeys and his pig, <clears throat> Romero excused himself when he said, ah, so the man was yapping. Romero's like, okay, okay, enough's enough, get back to work. But Romero doesn't say that. You could tell because Romero goes in the house, right? The old man thanked Romero for the food, and as soon as he was finished with the beer, went after the work sincerely with doll shears. He sharpened them, so to speak, against a rock wall. The old man sniffed garishly, hope, hopping and jumping around the bush, around and around. It gave Romero such pleasure to watch that this was all he did from the front window. So Romero's watching this guy. Look at this guy. Man, he's having the time of his life out there. <clears throat> the work didn't take long. So as the old man was raking up the clippings, Romero brought out a $5 bill. He felt that the old man's dancing around that bush in those baggy old checker pants was more inspiring than religion. But a couple of dollars was extra price to see the old man's eyes like a boy. The old man was so pleased that he invited Romero to that little ranch of his in Mexico where he was sure they could share some aguardiente, or maybe Romero could buy a turkey from him. They were skinny, but they could be fattened. But in any case, they could enjoy a bottle of tequila together with some sweet lemons. That's never going to happen, right? Romero, and here's the moment, too, we get like the crux of the story. Like, what the hell is Romero's shirt? Why is the story the story? Top of 245, Romero wasn't used to feeling so virtuous. He so often was disappointed, so often dwelled on the difficulties of life or class, the American dream. I busted my ass and this is all I have. That he had become hard, guarding against compassion and generosity. Who guards against compassion and generosity? Well, you let your guard down too many times and people take advantage of you too many times. You're gonna have this guard like Romero, right? You're not gonna be as easy to trust. You're not gonna be easy to do, you know, think of all these things. So much so that he even becomes spare with his words, even with his family, spare with his words is why the story is told in a third person narrator point of view. We don't get Romero's words. Romero's not a talker. His wife whispered to the children that this was because he was tired and since it wasn't untrue, he accepted it as the exclamation too. It spared him that worry and from having to discuss why he liked working weekends and taking a day off during the week like this one. But now an old man had re made Romero wish his family were there with him so he could give as much more to them so he could watch them their spin around dances. He'd miss so many. Romero loves his family. 
Romero is works his whole life for his family. However, you know, I bet you Romero probably didn't go to a lot of his kids' sporting events or whatever, right? Because why? I could be working. You know, I'm paying I'll pay for all your sport clothes, equipment, you know, I'll I'll spare you nothing. I got to work, you know. So there so in one way he he's missed so many. He's missed so many of these moments and he's thinking about this now. And Romero swore he would take them all into Juarez that night for dinner. They don't go out to eat very often, right? Romero, why the hell would we pay this money to go out to eat when we can make it at home for so much less? He might even convince them to take a day, maybe two, for a drive to his uncle's house in Chihuahua instead, because he promised that so many years ago, so long ago, they probably thought about somewhere else by now, like San Diego or Los Angeles. Then he'd take them there. They go for a week, spend whatever it took. No expense could be so great. And if happiness was as easy as some tacos as a $5 bill, then how stupid it was had been of him to have offered it all this time. Romero felt so good, felt such relief. He napped on the couch. When he woke up, he immediately remembered his shirt, that it was already gone before the old man had even arrived. He remembered they'd walked around the juniper before it was cut. It was already gone before the old man arrived. The old man didn't take it, it was gone. That it was already gone before the old man had arrived. He remembered they walked around the juniper before it was cut. Nevertheless, the possibility that the old man took it wouldn't leave Romero's mind. Since he never believed in letting down, giving into someone like that old man, the whole experience became suspect. Maybe it was part of some ruse which ended with the old man taking his shirt, some food and money. This was how Romero thought. Though he held a hope that he'd left it somewhere else, that it was a lapse of memory on his part. He went outside, inside, looked everywhere twice, and more, one more time after that, his cynicism had flowered, colorful, and bitter. Damn that paragraph. Romero, I let my guard down for the first time in a long time, and this is what happens. I lose one of the things I value so much. I'm nice to this old man, and look, look how I'm repaid. And it, in it, the next paragraph, I love this moment too, because. Romero's a smart guy. Romero understands that it's not, Romero knows that it's not the end of the world. Romero knows that it's it's just a shirt, that it's, something didn't happen to me, but still, it's, it's, it's the thing that just bothers him. You know, what's the phrase? Straw that broke the camel's back, right? It's not all the horrible, horrible things. It's the one little thing. You know, your, your shoelace snaps and then you just snap, right? understand and this moment to the narrator is is talking to us the reader because we could be like damn Romero it's just a shirt man chill the chill out take it easy it's just a shirt you, you still have it but understand the narrator telling us understand that it was his favorite shirt that he never thought of replacing it and that his loss was all Romero could keep his mind on though he knew very well it wasn't a son or a daughter or a wife, or a mother, or father, not a disaster of any kind. It was a simple shirt and the true value of things not very much to lose. But understand also that Romero was a good man who tried to do what was right and who would harm no one willfully. Understand that Romero was a man who had taught himself to not care. Damn, what does it mean to teach yourself to not care? to not want, to not desire for so long that he lost many words, avoided many people, kept to himself alone, almost always, even when his wife gave him his meals, taught to not care, not want, not desire. Think of all the shitty jobs Romero's had, all the bosses, all the horrible things he had to put up with, which isn't even mentioned. It's unmentionable. Think of Ma and saving sortie everything she saw in Cambodia, her husband, her family, you know, it's unmentionable, it's not mentioned, but Romero taught himself not to care, not to want, not to desire, and give to his family. Family comes first. Understand that it was his favorite shirt, and though no more than that, for him it was no less, then understand, you know, what I love in this paragraph, understand, understand, 
understand, understand. I think it says it four or five times. And understand how he felt like a fool paying the old man, who he considered might even have taken like a fool for feeling so friendly and generous, happy when the shirt was already gone, like a fool for having all those and these thoughts for the love of a wool shirt. Damn, I should have never cared for that shirt so much. Like a fool for not being able to stop think, thinking them all, but especially the one reminding him that this was what he had always believed in. That loss was what he was most prepared for. That lo Romero's philosophy, guiding, always be prepared for loss, because he's lost so much, right? And so then you might understand why he began to stare out the window of his home, waiting for someone to walk by absently with it on, for the thief to pass by careless. What do you think Romero would do if he saw someone walk by with his shirt? He would take the rake and bash him, right? He kept a watch out the window as each of his children came in, then his wife. He told them only what had happened, and as always, they left him alone. He stared out that window onto the dirt street, past the Ocotillos and the Palos and the Gaves, the junipers and oaks and mulberries in front of other homes of brick or stone, painted or not. Past them to the buildings in Juarez. And he watched the horizon darken and the sky light up the moon and stars and the land spread with shimmering lights so bright in the dark blot of night. He heard dogs barking until another might bark farther away and then another, back and forth like that. The small rectangles and squares of their fences plotted out distinctly in his mind's eye as his lids closed. Then he heard a gust of wind bend around his house. And then came the train, the metal rhythm getting closer until it was as close as it could be the steel pounding the earth like a beating heart, until it diminished and then faded away and then left the air to silence, to its quiet and dark. So still it was like death, or rest, sleep, until he could hear a grackle, and then another gust of wind, and then finally a car. I love those details. He looked in on his daughter, still so young, so beautiful, becoming a woman who would leave that bed for another. His son still boys when they were asleep, who dreamed like men when they were awake, and his wife, still young in his eyes, in the morning shadows of their bed. Romero went outside. The juniper had been cut just as he'd wanted it. He got cold and came back in and went to the bed and blankets his wife kept so clean, so neatly arranged as she slept under them without him, and he lay down beside her. So all this seething anger in Romero. Seething anger, but also a sense of loss What's the American, you know, let's look at the questions and we'll talk about it a little more. Describe Romero as a worker. Number two, what does he do? What can he do? Is he our hard worker? We, we discussed that. Answer question one on 245 of Romero's shirt. How do Romero's attitudes toward work reveal his character and values? I trust Romero. I would hire Romero to do anything. He's a good man. He's a great character. He has values, he has codes, he has rules he follows. If someone pays you to do a job, you do the damn job as best as you can. You get you give the person your money's worth. You do a good job, right? He he loves his, as we get this bitter, angry, sad Romero at the end, but Romero loves his family above everything. So in a dark, dark story, I think this is a dark story. And it's funny, in many ways, it's darker and scary, scarier than any, like, monster story, right? You can bust your ass and work hard all your life, and it's still just, it's not enough. But then Romero has his house and his family, right? So he does still have things. He has his family. How do you think Romero views the American dream? We get that in that early moment two forty three that top paragraph at one day at one time he wanted more he didn't want his family his children to be born in the county hospital he wanted more he thought there would be more he thought that he can get it just by work which is the is the American dream a lie we all believe that we think if we work hard and do everything right, we'll get any, uh, we'll get a place. And Romero has a high, I mean, he, Romero's better than where he came from. Is that all we can ask for? But he wanted more. 
think of the narrator in Sonny's Blues. He's a high school math teacher, but they still live in the projects. He wanted a little bit more. Not He didn't want to be a millionaire. He didn't want fancy stuff, just a little bit more, right? He wanted to give his kids and his wife a little bit more. So, you know, in many ways, Romero came here to El Paso to live a better life, and he's achieved more than what he came from, but it was, he wanted a little more, right? And we get Romero at the end, kind of cold and bitter, going to sleep in the house. But he still has his family. You know, Romero still has his wife and his kids. And I think that might give him some solace at the end of the day.